you know, went to Sutton Coalfield in Birmingham, passed the, uh, the the Paris selection process, which is a little bit tougher than everyone else. I wanted to do the honourable thing. I wanted to serve my country and Queen. I was obviously half cut and I was a bit tipsy and, 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 and macho peer pressure got the better of me. When I look at my family, I just think, my God, it's, it's like a gift from Mother Nature, you know? Dr. Stewart, how are you, brother? I'm okay. I'm a lot better than I was, Chris. Yes. I'm, yes. Um, it's been a journey. Um, it's, um, I'm in a, in, a, in, a, in, a, in a happier place. Um, yeah. Yeah, definitely. Yes, yeah, us veterans, we, we go through the mill a bit, don't, don't we? Or s- s- some of us do. Yes, and... I think it's important to, um, yeah, I, I don't know, with, with veterans, I think sometimes veterans are their own worst enemy. Um, and I've, I've kind of had to um, step away from the veteran thing and fill it with, with music. And, yeah, I've, I've started learning the saxophone again after many years and I feel a lot better about doing that. I'm, I'm also thinking about, you know, music, reading music, notes, tones, you know, all that, all that stuff, you know, which is, is like a, a beautiful distraction from, you know, the, the three years of hell that I went through working at a veteran charity. Um, and, you know, I walked away from in, in July, which the very day that um, Rishi Sunak and all them resigned, I, I, I resigned something like 9 a.m. in that, that morning. And uh, it was literally of, of, of writing a, a resignation letter and uh, handing it to one of the trustees who then handed it to the uh, CEO or boss or whatever he wants to call himself. But um, yeah, and I've not been back since. In fact, yesterday, uh, Remembrance Sunday, I, I went swimming, and it was great because I've I've got like a a, um, a free gym membership from an org- a great a wonderful organisation in Belfast, who've also uh, got me saxophone lessons for the next six months. Mm. So you know, swimming and saxophone is just just it's just been brilliant. I mean, I could go and beast myself in the gym, but I don't want to do that anymore. I just want to take it easy and swimming is the best thing you know when i go at the top and i dive in and you know i'm, I'm nearly swimming the, the full length of the pool underwater and it's a great feeling it really is um and you know maybe it was the fact of completing my thesis and and all that and uh, i felt i was trapped in this veteran mode for far too long and and i felt working at this charity um you know, this, this word banter, when I hear it, it makes me cringe. You know, oh, yeah, we've missed the banter. Well, banter is like a kind of other word for like kind of, it's like bullying talk. It's like that whole ribbing, that whole, and I felt psychologically bullied at that place in the end, and I had to move on. It was like they wanted me to kind of snap and you know, and then go, oh, yeah, typical ex-para, typical, you know, thick as fuck, all that sort of narrative. And um, I just just couldn't be doing it. It was this whole thing of of even, you know, you know, what, what, what the military has, this elitism within its different units and all this, and we're better than you and all that and stuff. And, and you know, it, to, to fight battles and all that sort of stuff, Fair enough. It's a bit like that SAS Rogue Heroes, isn't it? You know, people call it, oh, yeah, it's really great. Didn't realise they had to do all that really tough stuff. Yeah, Paddy Main was the dude. But if we actually look at the history of that time, they wanted to disband them because they didn't want that aggressive behaviour. Because you can't, I mean, I was in the sauna the other day when the sauna was working and a guy 
check my clock my tattoo. He said, ah, oh, wings. Yeah, he was, he was in the parachute regiment. I said, yeah, he said, yeah, this is my cattle stamp, you know. And, um, and he started going on about his father. He said, yeah, he said uh, he was in um, Korea. And uh, he says, yeah, he said, but he'd always, st- you know, when everyone, it, people would kick off, he'd always stop the fights, you know, because he'd, you know, lamp them and all this. I says, well, yeah, so you can't really have that attitude in, 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 in society today. And then he said, well, he died at 60 of an heart attack because he had such anger problems. And, um, and it made me, re- you know, it was just another example of just, you know, if, if, you've, if you have all this kind of intensity training, you really want to kind of think about things that are more, um, you know, well-being and, and kind of calm you down rather than, you know, crank you up. And, uh, and I felt that the, the charity that I, I, I resigned from was just, it was just bringing the worst out of me. I mean, I was to the point, the worst points was when I was just, I was physically sick before even going to work, you know, mm-hmm. and, you know, uh, dealing with the, 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 the guy in charge and then, you know, his trustee, he would, he would say that you were nothing, you're just a gopher, you're, you're not even a secretary. Not that I ever wanted to be a secretary anyway. Um, I felt I could kind of make things change or, or do things for, for the better. But to be honest, the, the, it was like they just wanted to, a lot of the, 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 uh, the cohort just wanted to remain in victim mode. And it just started getting to me. You know, it's, it's, I, I, I just didn't need their shit anymore. Do you know what I mean? And so the best thing was to, was to, was to walk away. And, you know, I, you know, I was, get, I was getting, I had a relatively okay wage, and uh, you know, I, I then had to go back on universal credit and do all that sort of carry on. But uh, I'm a lot happier that I'm doing things on my own terms, and and I'm feeling a lot better about myself mm-hmm. through making that choice. Um, and it's better. And my family have seen, a, a, you know, a, a better husband and father. Um, they didn't like all that sort of, as 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 they say in some realms, that, all that flag shagging. Do you know what I mean? It was just they, you know, didn't didn't like it. And uh, I certainly, you know, I mean, if I if I was that kind of into it, I would have done, you know, my my twenty two years. You know, I, I I did my minimum time and got out when I could because I I knew even then it was damaging my my brain cells and. Um, and yeah, I'm really glad I picked up the music again. And that really happened through my daughter bringing home a, 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 an alto saxophone from college because she's an oboe player and she thought, you know, just have a go on the sax. And I, I, I put it together and uh, blew a few notes and uh, and I just carried on practicing every day. And uh, I was getting, you know, um, treatment from Tills and mentioned, you know, what, you know, what was you doing before all the traumas began in Northern Ireland? And I said, well, I was going to be a saxophone player, you know, because at one point I was going to join the regimental band um, because I told them a story about when 1983, back in the time when schools had, um, you know, were very proud of their brass bands. Um, I lived in this, a, a part of uh, South Manchester where they still had the, uh, the 11 plus. And I didn't get the 11 plus. So already, you know, as an 11 year old, I was like branded a failure. So I went to this secondary modern and uh, they had this brass band and, uh, oh, it's fantastic. You know, trombone players, trumpet players, you know, the guy on a saxophone. And anyway, I won this toss of a coin and uh, this guy, Mr. Jones, a Welsh teacher, a big burly rugby player type said, you know, who wants to play the saxophone? And of course I was, I was really into like, you know, madness and Dex's midnight runners and all that sort of stuff. And, uh, and I won the, the, the flip of the coin, you know, and, uh, and I started having these lessons. Well, unfortunately the school was knocked down after the year and, 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 and turned into an old people's home. And, uh, and then we moved to an, another part that we'll move to Warrington, Newtown. And, and that, that was it, you know? And, uh, so when I joined free power in Northern Ireland, 17 and, I was serving, you know, uh, booze to the uh, senior senior NCOs. The band came in, and uh, and I told them this story about you know back in '83. I was learning this, the alto sax, and uh, they said, "Well, we'll have you in the band." 
And I said, what, well, just like that? He says, yeah. He says, because you've got your parachute wings, because when you join the, the regimental band, you don't do your P company and all that stuff. You do, I think, four weeks basic training, and then you go to the academy, you know, uh, academy of music. So anyway, I had the, uh, and I thought, yeah, you know, I already saw problems just through serving alcohol to these senior NCOs, you know, that this world, this world of being a paratrooper in free para was going to be problematic. And, uh, you know, and um, so I went and had an interview with a bandmaster and um, and he said, yeah, he said, well, you know, have a, have a go on the altar, have a go on the, on the tenor. And I was, I was good on the altar and I was good on the baritone. The baritone is the massive sax. And he could probably say, well, yeah, we'll get him on that because it weighs a ton. Do you know what I mean? Anyway, um, he says, yeah, we'll, we'll have you. You'll fly back to England, go to the Academy of Music. And uh, so I went to have a few beers in um, the Naffy Bar in, in Palace Barracks. And I met this guy from Grimsby from B Company. And I told him, yeah, I've just been accepted to join the regimental band. And he says, you don't want to do that, mate. You want to join Battling B. You know what I mean? Gypsy platoon, four platoon. Do you know what I mean? Mm. They started reeling off who who was in the uh, the company, and there was there was all these kind of like celebrities from the Paris TV series in B Company. Sergeant Riley, who was now a Sergeant Major Riley, although they called him Mavis Riley, that was his nickname. And uh, yeah, Fleming, yeah, the other guy, yeah, Flem, he was the jock. Anyway, so I was obviously half caught. And I was a bit tipsy and, 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 and macho peer pressure got the better of me. But, you know, I was only 18 years old. And like a, and like a darn fool, I signed my life away to B Company. I remember my first stint um, um, in B Company. We was on guard duty. And this guy, Pete, came in, Pete Mack. Um, he, he died a, a, um, a while back. A lovely guy. Um, Glaswegian Catholic. He'd come from 15 power to, to free power. And and he's like, you know, I says, all right, you know, I'm, I'm Pete, you know, what's your name, blah, blah, blah. And so I told him the story that I was going to join the regimental band and be a saxophone player. And he said, fucking hell, man, you had that opportunity and you joined this shit all. And, um, and I thought, yeah, you know, he's, he's kind of right, you know. And uh, I had to just crack on like you do. You know, once you've made that choice, that's it. You know, the portal closes. And, you know, there's no chance of like, going, well, I don't like it here in B Company now. And this is, this is all getting a bit hairy. Can I join the band? I'm sorry to have let you down first time. But can I, can I rejoin? There was no chance of that. So um, so I went on and, and uh, did my time with, with B Company and, uh, and then became a unit photographer and... Uh, and that whole photography thing. And uh, the saxophone was always there, um, you know, because I always loved music. And I realised now just how, you know, where I might have been the generation when, when we all had Walkmans, you know, was just plugged our Walkmans in all the time, you know. Any chance to get your Walkmans in, and that, that, that was, you know, yeah, it was always there. Um, but I never quite had that, you know, that, that lump sum, that £600 to, to buy my own instrument. And um, when I was going, when I've been going through therapy with Tills, I told them this story, and uh, and they said, "Well, let's try and write a letter to to Safra, and then you could have a word with the military charities." And anyway, did the Royal British Legion got me a a John Paul AS four hundred alto saxophone, uh, and every day I practice, and um, you know, it's I mean I. I would say that I'm into the into the jazz thing, but I think any music with a saxophone is, is just brilliant. I mean, I, I've I've got uh, six months of, of lessons as well from an organisation in Belfast, and uh, the teacher only lives around the corner from me. He's a, a guy from New Zealand, but he played with Gino Washington and uh, Joan Armour Trading, you know, and uh, and I'm just learning the basics, and it's really it was quite. Brought a bit of a tear to my eye when he gave me this a tune a day book, and I thought, "Fuck it, man! I remember this book in '83, you know, and all these little jingles, you know, and it's it's a bit old fashioned, you know, Twinkle Twinkle Little Star and God Save the Queen and all this sort of stuff." But it, it's it's all about these building blocks of learning about music, and uh, anyway, so um, I, I, I sort of let these friends of mine, well, these, these guys who I've, I've optioned these film rights to Pigs Disco um, and they, the idea is, is they're going to do a TV pilot series and uh, 
and I mentioned the saxophone story to them, and he said, "Well, yeah, we've, you know, we've we've seen a few pictures on your Instagram account, and uh, he says, you know, maybe maybe you could play on the soundtrack." And I thought, well, you know, I kind of know with these things anyway that they're long and drawn out, but I just felt it was something to aim for, so I could get to a certain standard, and these lessons would be perfect, you know, because how I approached this guy was was literally I just relayed the story which i've just told you and uh and it was really good to kind of let him know you know where i've come from i'm not you know i, I have a, a, a different kind of pupil if you like you know i have had a bit of a a journey but when i told him this that about um you know getting to a certain standard where i could confidently you know if if, if the opportunity did arise where you know i could play play on that that then that would be fantastic mm -hmm. you know what i mean it's it Stu, can you tell us about Pig's Disco? Um, yeah, well, soon after the book was published, it was optioned quite early on. Um, and it was with a company that was branching into film. Um, they're like some kind of like, you know, hipster kind of organisation on o Old Street, you know, all around them kind of where Vice and all that um, were located. And um, anyway, that went on for a few years. And, and then when... When when the pandemic happened, everything kind of changed, you know. And uh, but anyway, these two guys and these two guys, um, uh, Luke Seymour and Joseph Bull, um, they they kept in touch because I, I did a film with them called Isolation, which was premiered at the uh, Edinburgh Film Festival. I'll, I'll email you the link because it was a free Vimeo. Because what they did, they put it on Vimeo as a free download join you know, the isolation period, <laughs> you know, funny enough. We, you know, kept in touch and uh, they, they're now represented by some other, other you know, quite, quite well-known organisation. The organisation that produced, they did the film about the, I don't know if you saw the film of, of some British actress who played a Muslim woman who goes over to Calais and finds that her husband's actually married to someone else. It's a really good film. But anyway, they do a lot of British films and all that, but... Uh, the idea is they were going to make a, a TV pilot series of, of, of Pig's Disco. I mean, it's a case of it's, you know, people have shown interest, whether it actually happens, but uh, is another thing. It's, it's something which even where I work, I do a bit, of, I, I do like roadie work, at, like a cultural centre uh, nearby. Um, like an in-house roadie. And uh, he said, well, you know, what about the photography? You're going to pick that back up. I said, well, to be honest, I'm, I'm, I'm not really that bothered about reinventing myself. I am bothered about reinventing myself for, for going back to the saxophone after many years. But photography, um, I kind of done what as much as I could. I got to the point where I just felt, well, what am I doing this for? Just to post pictures on Instagram and get likes. Do you know what I mean? Mm -hmm. You know, I used to get commissions. I used to, you know, yeah do stuff for the newspapers, magazines, and, uh, you know, and, and I thought, well, and I said to him, I said, well, I've already been immortalised in, in, the, in the British Library because uh, of the two books, and if the, uh, if the TV series happens, then, you know, brilliant, but I'm not getting too, like, bothered about it. I mean, it's a bit like when I was talking to my son who's, who's working in film. He said, well, you, you could have... Uh, you could have been really selfish dad and just said, well, do you know what? I've got, you know, I'm married, I've got kids, but you know what? I'm more interested in being, you know, my career as a photographer. So I'm going to go off to the next war zone and this, that, and because I'm so great. And, you know, uh, and, and that kind of, it takes over your life and you can't be top of the game all the time. And uh, so I just felt, no, nah, you know, it's, I, I've, I've got to look after, look after what's going on up here. And, um, yeah, it's, I mean, it's like, even when I look like you go on social media, see some guy I photographed, you know, soon after he got seriously injured, he's now like some poster boy for the Royal British Legion or whatever. And he's been photographed by such and such. And do you know what I mean? It's, I kind of lit the fuse all them years ago. Um, I mean, I, I was doing, I, I, like with, with with the injured stuff, you know, it appeared in GQ magazine. Then, then the news of the world and the Mail on Sunday then picked up on the story. And then, oh, you know, so terrible how our veterans are treated. And then, you know, help for heroes was came about. And I've never really had, uh, other than the fact of of 
you know, being paid for the for the work that I've done for the commissions and, and, and getting published. I never really had much acknowledgement other than, you know, the, the, the Brighton Photo Fringe Open where I had a big exhibition. Because in the veteran world, you've always got someone who thinks they know better than you. And then they'll try and outrank you and they'll go, well, I was commissioned. And it's a bit like that where I worked. Do you know what I mean? I was commissioned. Yes, so what? I mean, he actually said, oh, I was doing a doctorate, um, but I didn't have the time to finish it. Now, in my world, that means you've jacked. Do you know what I mean? You fucking jacked, mate. Do you know what I mean? You couldn't handle it. I didn't have time to finish it. Um, and... You know, all this so-called banter, yeah, fair enough. And you probably have your same kind of banter in the Royal Marines. I'd have to certain things in, 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 in Pararege. And I couldn't deal with all this banter, um, you know, and this kind of very localised kind of regional kind of attitudes. Do you know what I mean? Mm. I think if I worked for a veteran charity, I'd have to work in central London. Because something where they have to be diverse, you know, they have to think about what, you know, they, I mean, again, ethics. I did a whole thing in my PhD surrounding ethics. And I found where I worked was ethically wrong. Mm. <laughs> you know, I couldn't agree with the politics. I mean, if you've got a boss whose idol is Jacob Rees-Mogg, I mean, Jesus, man. Do you know what I mean? I, I couldn't, I couldn't maintain it. I mean, I, I was going to leave um, the July before. Um, but, I mean, after the, what happened in Afghanistan, I just, I, my whole, I just thought, you know, I, you know, it's not a question of losing faith. I didn't have much faith in the government anyway. I mean, it seemed like yesterday when I when I went to the co-op and I was talking to a woman, she had a poppy on her. She said, "Oh." Um, Oh, it's a lovely day, isn't it? You know, a nice day for the, for Alexandra Park where they did it. I said, well, I didn't bother going. I just went swimming instead, um, and I felt a lot happy for it. And um, and then she's I don't know how the story goes, but it was like, you know, uh, you know, was you ex-military? Yeah, I, I served, you know, in the parachute regiment, you know, blah, blah, blah. And how uh, I sort of ended it, I said, well, I just didn't want to do dirty work for politicians, and that's what it was. And I can't, I, you know, I, I just couldn't agree, couldn't agree of being that kind of subservient kind of yes, sir, person to something I didn't agree on. And that's why I left in 93. I, I know, could no longer agree with it. So working in a veteran charity, um, I, I just could not agree with, with where it was going, how it was run. And it was, I mean, he actually started whistling the, the theme tune to the Wizard of Oz because it's literally like the Wizard of Oz. You know, we're all we're all walking, aren't we? All marching away to what? To nothing. Do you know what I mean? And it's just the same old stuff going on. You know, the you know the, the same old kind of presentations. And I was just bored shitless, man. It was just like you know. And I and I just got into um, and I, as I got into the saxophone, I, I, I came across, I think I typed in auto saxophone in Instagram, and I came across this black and white footage of this, this like, Italian-looking photographer, uh, not photographer, saxophonist. And I thought, wow, man, he sounds really cool. You know, and it, it was this song called The Trip. And I thought, wow, you know, it's, it's kind of, anyway, Art Pepper. And I bought his, his, his autobiography, his, his, you know, his book about his, his life, Straight Life, it's called. It was written by his wife. And he'd been incarcerated, you know, been in San Quentin prison, 15 years banged up, you know, because he'd, he he was a well-known jazz musician. And they kept going, you know, any needle marks in your arm and all that sort of stuff, banging him up all the time. But when he got out and he went to some kind of drug rehab, I listened to the music because I, I got a few of the CDs, uh, Living Legend and, and The Trip. And I just thought, I really get what... I can really get what he's saying through the saxophone. And it just, I just thought, wow, you know, I mean, not that I'm going to, you know, get into, you know, using heroin again, stuff like that. It was, it was more the sense of, you know, that, that you've been imprisoned. And that's how I felt when I was at that charity. I felt, I felt really imprisoned. I felt really put in the corner. I mean, he seemed like um, 
one of the trustees, like I said, you know, comes in and says, you know, you're nothing. You're not, e you're not even a secretary. You're just a gopher. And yeah, it was, it was like being some Batman, you know, like, you know, in, 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 in Black Adder, mm -hmm. <laughs> you know, although that was quite funny. This wasn't, this was doing my head in. And, and I was, it was very interesting to sort of see how power, how, you know, when people, because, you know, they, they got a bigger, um, bigger area, you know, they got a floor, you know, the bigger office space. But the more bigger it became, the more power went to these guys' heads. And it was, for me, it was just really toxic, you know. And also, now I'm doing swimming and I'm not eating that shit food at that place. I'm actually looking a lot fitter in myself as well. You know, I'm, it, yeah, it's, so I had to eradicate the professional veteran or veteranism and fill it with a saxophone, and uh, and that's where I am, Chris. Mm. And I'm a lot happier for it. Yeah, the power of music, mate. I'm really happy for you. It's um, it's quite funny. One of the best things I ever did was uh, walk away from the highest paid job that I ever had. <laughs> I've never yeah. really, I've never really ever. This might surprise people. I've never really earned more money than I did in the military, mm. and and that wasn't a lot, you know. Yeah, of course. I'd, I'd a little spell with my own company when took me to Hong Kong, and and that one month we turned over a hundred grand. It was just ridiculous, and I was still in the Marines, right? So I got like three and a half grand that month, and this is twenty five years ago, right? There's a yeah, lot, yeah. but um, other than that, you know, I've always gone for experiences over over like the regiment of a of a career until now, obviously. Hmm. Um, but one job I had, um, it was ridiculous. I mean, I was 26 grand a year. I, I took, I, I just saved over half of it. I spent 12 grand to go scuba diving in Ant Antarctica, right. To buy all the kit and do all the training and stuff. But to, uh, to our friends out there, if, if you're under that stress in a job, if you're going to bed thinking about it, if you're waking up like early in the morning and you go straight into fight or flight mode because you're that stressed, walk away, right? It will be the best thing you ever did. Even if you take a 50% pay cut in what you do, life's too short, isn't it, Stu? It's too yeah. short to, to, to be, and you can't change other people's outlooks and agendas. And if you're a fairly sort of, you know, sensitive type, which I think a lot of, I think a lot of people are not, not just veterans, it, you're not going to change that environment. And it's what you, the term toxic comes to mind. Yeah. Um, yeah. Guess what I just built? Go on. What did you just build? I just built a sauna. Oh, I've seen that. Yeah. The sauna. <laughs> wow. <laughs> Mate, I've been in it this morning. Don't put any over soil on the on the on the on the coals though, or the rocks. Because oh, why is that? Well, we we've got one here at the sports centre because I always get a sauna and a swim, and uh, and it was funny because he said, "Oh, you need to have a shower before you go in the swimming bath." Anyway, uh, someone put oil on the on 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 the uh, on the rocks, and it's been closed down. <laughs> and I reckon it's over soil. I do know? that. I do. I've done that every day. That's well. That's really... what we used to do. Uh, yeah, then, yeah. As long as loads you... of it. You only put like three or four drops or something, and it and it really, it's like. So what was it, it used, in the raves? What was it? People used to have Vicks like vapor rub. But yeah, they yeah. Just yeah, to... I remember one. I remember one guy is uh, and and these two chicks were like rubbing it in his temples. Yeah, Vic vapor rub, and he was like. <laughs> 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 You know, yeah. He had but, his um, he had his white gloves on, so he couldn't do it himself. That's right, yeah. Yeah, his NBC <laughs> gloves. Is it, what is it? Big fish, little fish, cardboard box. <laughs> yeah. my, my girlfriend taught my son that. <laughs> Excellent. <laughs> yeah. Yes. So, um, yes, I've had a sauna today, and I've had two. I've I bought this big old whiskey barrel, right? It's big enough to fit about three people in it. Oh wow! <laughs> I've I, I spent all all afternoon yesterday cleaning it out because it gets a bit 
over the summer they, they, they get a bit polluted you know so i gave it a good clean yesterday fresh water today and oh it's just yeah there's yeah. nothing better in the morning you know oh yeah 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 exactly it's uh it's it's good to especially if you've got your own yeah it's uh it's fantastic yeah i mean i i've my wife and i we've got like a gym membership for the year and uh it's just great having that. I mean, it's only just a walk down the road and, uh, but knowing that I've got that, you know, and I always religiously, obviously have to do going to swimming on Wednesday before my, before my saxophone lesson and stuff. And, um, but it's just great. You know, I don't have to go there, beast myself on the, the, the sewing machine or the rowing machine or whatever, you know, and, and just see all them, you know, dickheads sort of like pumping it out. You know, it's, it's, I just go swimming, man. It's, it's mm-hmm. the best thing, you know, and, and it's really, yeah, it's. And to be honest, when I joined up uh, at sixteen, and we're all sort of saying, "Who can do the army swimming test?" And I, who, 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 no, who who feels they can't pass the army swimming test? And I put my hand up, and because uh, I wasn't a confident swimmer, um, so what I did I went and had lessons. So I had to get up about. I had to get up before everyone else, um, and go and have swimming lessons. Uh, it was like five o'clock in the morning. I get up. So I'd have swimming lessons and I'd cross country lessons afterwards. I was, I was well fit, but because of that time of, of it's like four times around the pool, isn't it? Breaststroke, and then four minutes uh, tread water. Mm. I can only do breaststroke. I'm so kind of I was so um, I wouldn't say traumatized, but it, it it had such an impact on me just swimming like that. I, I can't do any other kind of way <laughs> even to this day. But That's- breast. Breast, breaststroke is good anyway. One of the best things I did in my life, and I was about 47 years old, is I went on YouTube and I, I looked up how to do the front crawl. Oh, yeah, yeah. Then I went to the pool, got got a nice pool here. It's fi- fi- sometimes it's 25 minutes, but sometimes they open it up to 50, which just seems like a marathon, right? And little by little, I just taught myself front crawl. At first... I could only do one length and I was so exhausted. I have to hang on to the side of the pool and the lifeguards would come over and say, are you all right? Yeah. And within uh, about two years of just teaching myself, I did my second triathlon. Oh, wow. Uh, first triathlon was at Torquay or Torbay area. And it was a, uh, a mile swim. I came I came last in that triathlon, right? I was so late that they, when I got off the bike to do the run, the officials come running over and said, sir, sir, could you just stop now? Because we all want to go home. And I said, look, look, shove your medal. I don't need that, but I'm not stopping now, right? Yeah. So I came last in that triathlon and I, and, and I said to myself, right, in eight weeks' time, I'll do a quadruple Ironman triathlon. (laughs) So with eight weeks training, um, I then swam nine miles, ran a cycle 450 and ran 108 miles. The extra, Mm. the extra eight miles is because I kept, it was an ultra run up in Sherwood forest and I kept getting lost, (laughs) but you know, Human beings are amazing. I taught myself front crawl in two years. It's one of the most satisfying arts. It's like an art. You have to get your posture right. You have to learn how to breathe. You have to learn how to shape your hands in the water. You have to have to learn how to kick and you get better and better. And then suddenly you come home from the pool. You've just swum a mile, a mile doing something you never could do in your life. Um, it really, really, really satisfying. Yeah. Well, I'll have a look into that because I, I remember all my kids taking my kids for um, swimming lessons and they were kind of learning all that, you know, it just sort of you mentioning it, you know, the whole thing of, yeah, the old the hand yeah. movement and stuff. But the it's Navy, great. The Navy SEALs say stretch out on the water. You're trying to just stay flat and you stretch and Which that, is good for you anyway, isn't it? Just the mm-hmm. whole thing for your for your body, isn't it? You know, yeah. Yeah. Do you stuff. do you remember Akabilk? No. He was a famous was it clarinet player? He he 
or flute player he played stranger on the sh- was it stranger on the shore right do 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 oh, <laughs> i fucked it up already <laughs> it's <laughs> a really it it's it's just such a beaut a, a beautiful what's his piece. name Acker Bilk, he was, I think he was a, a Brizzle boy from Bristol. Um, he, he he died, not recently, but I think he's died in the last few years. But uh, for me, it just actually conjures up a beautiful woman walking down the beach towards me. Yeah. Which is something, you know, I've had to put up with most of my life. Um, then they normally walk past me and hug, hug the guy behind. <laughs> Hey, tell us about Paddy Considine. Oh, yeah. Paddy Considine. We were at university together. Mm. Um, and, yeah, we we're doing editorial photography. We both kind of, um, you know, used a two and a quarter kind of twin lens camera. I think he had a Mamiya, I had a Rolleiflex. It was a, probably a bit kind of wary of me. He thought I was probably one of the druggy types because maybe I had that kind of reputation of being a bit bit crazy sort of then, you know, and all that. And, you know, I talk about acid a lot and, you know, whatever. And, you know, I was kind of involved with the, with the illegal rave scene and all that. You know, it's, you know, the, it's not, you know, I wasn't going to kind of wear it like a medal, but that's what, you know, because mm. I, I went to university, um, was it end of 94? Yeah, end of 94. So end of 94, 94 was the year that the criminal justice bill came in. So that's when I did them famous photographs of of, of uh, the Oven Dean rave, which have been used in many exhibitions and uh, there was and and um, stuff and um, and then and joined university and uh, but yeah he he was um, he did a thing on boxers and Elvis Presley and Gypsy bare knuckle fighters and and uh, yeah he was he was a good good good, good guy and uh, he. Uh, and we, you know, a few parties we, uh, student powers went to and stuff like that. And, uh, but he did this thing, Dead Man's Shoes, didn't he? Uh, which, um, absolutely, my, my, my tutor, because uh, we, we both have the same personal tutor, Mark Power, who's a magnum photographer, which is like this prestige agency, which many photographers, including myself, were, you know, wanted to be put, come part of. I'm not that bothered about it anymore because my, my, um, the person who was going to get me in was a guy called Philip Jones Griffiths, uh, who did a lot of work out in the Vietnam War, uh, Welsh photographer from Rill. And I'd, I'd, he was uh, my kind of mentor, if you like. But he died of cancer um, in 2008, uh, the year I moved to Hastings. And and with that, my kind of chances of becoming part of Magnum Photos. It, it, although people would probably say, oh, no, that wasn't the case at all. But, you know, that's... Uh, you know he's a good guy and obviously with same name and everything like that but anyway mark power uh said paddy he said i've seen dead man's shoes he says that character reminds me of someone and he says yeah it's based upon griff which was what everyone called me um because griff is griff that was my army nickname when i was at university so what do you want to be known as Stuart or griff and because i'd already moved to Brighton and the new people, everyone called me Griff. Do you know what I mean? I mean, now I, I, I when people call me Griff, I'm just like, ah, I, I just kind of walk the other way. Do you know what I mean? I don't, I mean, there's a few people from that time, especially within the rave culture that it's okay because they remember me of, mm. of from, from that. But, um, but he said, yeah, he said, he said he's based it on Griff. So I remember watching it and I was living in London at the time. And I remember watching it and I got to the funeral bit. And he was there lowering his the, the coffin of, of, of his brother. And he's got a power reg berry on. And and I just thought, Jesus, man, someone could have told you how to shape that a bit better. Um, and anyway, I gave, I sent Paddy a copy of Pig's Disco. And I mean, I've not really had communication other than Instagram. You know, he, I, he'd, he'd say, you know, um, you know, cheers, mate, or what, you know. It, but anyway, when, when at that time he was on Twitter and I sent him a copy of Pig's Disco and he, sa- he sent a reply and he said, you know, I, I, I know nothing. I know nothing. And I think that's, it was reference to how he perceived how I was. I was this druggy type. I was quite wayward. I was a bad influence. 
you know, he was like, you know, I, you know, I, mean, I go to boxing gym, I'm like, ah, oh, fitness wins, which, you know, I, I get all that. <laughs> you know, I served in the parachute regiment, you know what I mean? Mm. And, um, and I think when he read that book, he realised that there's a drug thing, there was a reason for that. Mm. And when I look back at, at that time and I look back at Pig's Disco and people, you know, the, uh, I mean, I, I might have said this before, but um, I remember when it was... Uh, did a thing on mail the mail online did a piece on it and within four minutes of seeing it on facebook it'd been shared 448 times and it wasn't you know it was basically incoming do you know what i mean you've disgraced the regiment you fucking wanker watch your back you're gonna you're gonna fucking you and your family are gonna be fucking taken out really nasty shit went on for quite a couple of you know Mm. good couple of years and um you know, and and uh, really, what what it was all about was was how do you maintain the uh, the the the, pr- the pressurized the stress of it all? Do you know what I mean? And there was this whole thing of like, yeah, we didn't take drugs, but we drunk like fuck. You know what I mean? That sort of well, I don't know what it was like in the Royal Marines, but certainly in in Free Parrot, we were always pushing it, pushing the boundaries, whatever we could do. And of course, that whole thing of, of acid house or that in the late eighties. I mean, I joined in eighty eight, which was, you know, they call it the, the the second summer of love, don't they? You know, the Spike Island Stone Roses thing. I was marching up and down the square, all doing bayonet practice. Do you know what I mean? And um, but whether you know, you can cocoon the young soldier as much as you can, but he will be exposed to what's happening in 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 you know. What, what what's happening in the world, you know what I mean? Mm. And it filtered through, you know, that whole thing. And um, so, so yeah, that was, that was Pad, Paddy. Um, yeah, I mean, he's, he's done really well. You know, he's, he's had a, you know, great career and all that. I mean, he, his friend, he was, I think, a good friend of Shane Meadow. Not, yeah, Shane Meadow's the guy, mm, this yeah. is England. And, and that's how, you know, it, it kind of started. And, and like I say, you know, the portal opened and he, he, he went through it and, and carried on, you know, and, uh, but yeah, dead man's shoes. Uh, yeah, it's, it was, it was based upon, um, Griff. That is According incredible. To Mark from Magnum photos. That's amazing. I was just thinking about that film the other day because we watched hot fuzz for about the umpteenth time. Yeah. And he plays one of the, was it CID in it or something? And, 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 there's a great, there's a great line in it. It's not his line. It's, 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 it's the girl. I, I can't remember. She's a great actress. I can't remember her name, but she plays one of the coppers. And when they're in the supermarket battling all the Satanists, oh, she, yeah. she, it, it's like she, it, it's something like she picks up a supermarket trolley and hits this, this satanic um member of the village this is this, this other woman and she turns to paddy and uh and his his cid partner and she goes i like a bit of girl on girl action <laughs> it's just, you know that 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 laddish culture that you you you, you yeah you know that that that, that where that you kind of get, you get that these, loaded um, magazine kind of era time wasn't it yeah yes <laughs> but yeah, yeah. He's, he's you know yeah good good luck. Well, I, I sent him a copy of the of, of the of the book, which which I mean now um, you know it, it sold out very very rapidly. Um, so yeah yeah it's 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 good you know it's and you know and he does his he's riding with the low music you know and all that because he, he I think he put a picture up about because he's doing this Game of Thrones thing and he was sort of saying. Um, yeah, I'm going to start the band. And I went, oh, what, the Pedestrians? Because that was the university band he was in. He played the drums in it. And uh, and he thought that was funny, you know, laughing emoji. You know, cheers, Paddy. <laughs> yes, we'll have to try and get him on the podcast. That would be, he'd make a great guest. Yeah, um, yeah. Because yeah. he's been, he's, you know, he's done really well, really well. Yeah, exactly. Mm. Yes. Um, what, what did you do your thesis in was that photography it, yeah i would say it was the it was certainly the photography department at ulster university so i did a, my thesis was called the soldier's camera um ba- barracks to battlefields 1974 to 20 2011 
So it's ba- he was looking at all uh, the personal photographic collections of of a certain demographic of soldier um, from the seventies to the present. So looking at Northern Ireland, looking yeah. at you know uh, the Falklands, you know, and and you know all them kind of wars. Uh, what happened in that period? You know, Bosnia, Kosovo, um, you know, Afghanistan, obviously in Iraq, and uh, and it was all about the. Uh, personal narratives but it was also about my question was because uh, you always have to have a question in, in 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 phd thesis world is um you know why is this area of war photography not acknowledged and and that's what i under under you know unpicked through through the research and that but i also in a conclusion i said how such photography can help in in therapy because i know king's college uh the veterans mental health conference they gave a big um, presentation, some doctor, what, such and such a guy, you know, it was, and, and it was this 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 whole thing of, um, is it free D M E R or something? So what you you were on a treadmill walking, and it's a bit like a Clockwork Orange, where you you've got all these, you know, you're wired up, and you and you're walking through all these photographs of your personal photographs, and I I wasn't really going to say. That yeah, this is a great thing. This is the way it should go forward. But it, it was about it, my my um, argument was was well, this is how photographs have been used, and you know, is it a good way or is it a bad way? I mean, the fact that I I compared it to a Clockwork Orange with the you know, the treatment he has, you know, to make make him a kind of better person within society, um, ask questions within itself. But uh, it took me six years in the end to do and uh you know signed off and all that and uh i mean i have people sort of emailing me i had one some someone who's i think served in the raf as a photographer or videographer can i see your thesis please you know and i'm thinking no you're not actually you know because it was it was hoodwinked to become a book but i sent it to a few publishers and people who i know and all that but no one was really that interested and and it's a bit like the article I wrote um, in, in the byline investigates, um, which, you know, it, you can only get, I could only get an article in, in an organization like that, which is byline, which, because everything's become so, I mean, I, you know, whatever pe- person's political leaning is, but everything's become so conservative everywhere across the board. And it all started happening around about, well, in 2010, you know, and uh, I, uh, it's just kind of taken over where it's, and that's why I felt, how can I sustain a photography career? Do you know what I mean? Where I haven't got the double barreled name. I haven't got the, uh, you know, the uh, Ox, Oxbridge kind of education and photography like now. Yeah. It's like come back to its Victorian era where it's just a thing of privilege, you know, whereas disregard the fact that Karl Marx had written something about the, the industry of photography it, it then got taken over by the bourgeoisie kind of and science lot to say, oh, you know, this is, you know, do you know what I mean? It's 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 a, it's a weird thing. Did you get mates with the SAS lad on your para course, on your jump jumps course? I mean, which which SAS guy was that? I was just looking at that Daily Mail article, and there's one one lad's got the Sandy Berry. Um, it, it, I might it, it's a bit of a, bit of oh, a vague. That, that, that would have been Bryce Norton. Um, yeah, no, there's Bryce. a few of them. There's a few of them who I know who, who I was in with, um, and guys that had come up to the battalion who come into my room, who I'd make sure that because five platoon uh, above had a quite a notorious kind of way of, 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 you know, the respirator squad and all that sort of stuff. They're a little bit perverted and weird. And, uh, but anyway, these guys went on to have big careers in, in, in Tutu and stuff like that. Uh, there's quite a few of them I've met over time, but you know, it's, it's, uh, I think the last time I spoke to, to, to that yeah, person in particular, he was a very good friend. I mentioned about, um, this was before, um, uh, you know, the Russia actually invaded Ukraine, and uh, this is when it was all bubbling away. I said, "Have you got any projects out there?" And that's when I was a bit, still a bit keen on, on doing stuff. And he said, oh, "This is our disclosure agreement would be is a bit too robust, you know." And blah, you know, it was, it was a wording of of that to say, "Well, someone like yourself, we can't really have around," you know what I mean? Mm. And 
someone like myself is probably because because we've got the internet because I've had a lot of things that I've had published on there you know they don't do you know what I mean I've become a kind of tarnished person and you know maybe Pig's Disco is as much to do with that as well but yeah let, you know, can, can I just step in there Stu because I don't want you uh suffering unnecessarily right everybody knows what goes on in the forces forces yeah. friends at home it's just a cross representation of society and if if after cities go in raving do you think the forces aren't going to go as well of course they are i mean essentially what we're talking about here we're talking about popping a pill and then dancing your ass off for for four hours and and hu hugging your mates in it i mean it's not yeah. it's not like it's not like fucking criminal or something right but uh i you know one one I got into it just as I left to go to Hong Kong and, and things in Hong Kong were completely different. The the drug scene over there was very, really, really serious. It wasn't, a, you know, there was partying as well, but you're in the golden triangle over there. So everything you get is completely pure. And um, uh, when I tried crystal meth over there, I kind of knew I was going to have a bit of a problem with it. Right. But yeah. going back to the party thing, um, the, you know, I knew guys that used to go out dancing and they went on to get like the highest awards for gallantry. Yeah. And I'll tell you what, you, you won't want a better soldier by your side, you know? Yeah. Another chap went on to, uh, I think, for a, uh, to get a commission and, and become. I'm just going to say, like one of the most famous faces in the room. Right, like everyone, everybody knows. I'm, I can't say too much because I yeah, don't want to. Yeah. You know, I don't. He probably wouldn't want me to. But you know what? Like I'm talking, to probably the most famous face in the room in 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 the Marines and, but. It's fear, isn't it, that makes people like try to make you do in your life what they don't want to do in theirs. That I mean, there's one element. There's a lot to it, and the 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 the, the thing is, Stu. Right, I I say this a lot. I say it almost every day. In fact, I I live in paradise. Right, I bloody do. I've just got the best life ever, and I've created it for myself. And I've come from being chronically men mentally unwell after leaving the forces. Um, when I look at my family, I just think, my God, it's, it's like a gift from Mother Nature, you know? Yeah. Um, I wake up every day happy, even when, when I've got huge, huge challenges, and I do have huge challenges now and again, right? So my point is, well... I've clearly done everything right then, haven't I? <laughs> yeah. You know, I've done everything right. And I think experimenting a bit here and, and there, as long as you, you know, uh, you, you're aware of the dangers and there are dangers, you know, I've, I've the, the worst drug. And I can say this as a substance misuse specialist with probably 25 years experience is alcohol. Um, when you watch your mates drink themselves to death, and you go yeah. to see you go to see them in hospital, and they're all green, greeny yellow because the their body, their organs have stopped working, yeah. and their legs are swollen up like the size of an elephant, like literally the size of an elephant, right? And and you're there chatting to them, and you can see all they want to do is get out there and go down a pub, mm. right? It's a horrible, horrible experience for any right. The worst one. A lot of people don't understand that. They think, oh, it's like heroin or crap. No, that stuff you can only do for so long before it screws your life up so much. You have to get grounded and go, do you know what? I think I need to make some changes here, right? Yeah. And, you know, what did the rave scene teach me? And when I say rave, I mean the, the dance parties, house parties. First, you had the most beautiful music ever created fact right because house music is uplifting it's about the beauty of life and loving each other whereas normal music is about i'm a sad git and no one loves me and she's run away again and oh please come you, you know it's designed to keep you 
down in 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 what we call birth certificate identity so you had this most beautiful music with an incredible history where black kids and white kids would come together at a, a club called the house hence house music and they would dance without fear of of prejudice right yeah what did we learn through our experience we learned that you're stood in that club and they got that guy next to you is an accountant that guy next to you is is a refuse collector it defied all social protocol all this nonsense that you're taught at school that you got to be a bank manager to be a good person or a do- and it's like nonsense he's all right and he's all right and we're all going to go to a chill out party party now and, and and you know maybe have a puff on a spliff um it it was an incredible experience uh, I, I wouldn't change it for the world when i speak to modern people who are young like say maybe 10 15 years my junior and they're going out and i know you know i know several top djs they don't get it Stu. no they don't get it i'm like yeah one love and, and they're like what are you on about i'm like that's the you know the generation when it's it's it, it helped us to understand ourselves. it helped break through all that stupid social crap that keeps you locked in the matrix and and <laughs> my mate the other day went i got no idea what you're going on about i just yeah. go out and I'll just go out and play tunes and 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 I I wouldn't push anything on anybody who don't want to do it, Stuart. And I've always tried not to do that because I never want to be the person that might set someone on the slippery slope to addiction or something. Um, yeah. On and, and I should also say, you know, I watched my best best mate drown uh, on acid. Uh, watch two of my other best mates drink themselves to death. Um, it's a serious business, you know, you yeah, get, you get involved in it. You have to be prepared to pay the ultimate price. It's very rare. Well, not with the alcohol. If you've got a lifelong problem with that, you're probably going to die young, but it, it's, it, it's statistically incredibly rare with all the other stuff. Um, but that acid, mate, you just, you, you, you're taking a bit of a gamble there, folks, I'd say. Yeah, exactly. It's like it was a moment in time. You can't replicate, you know, that. And the thing is, it's about retaining the, um, trying to retain the kind of the okay memories of that. I mean, I mean, that's probably what Pigs Disco was, was, wasn't really about the route, but it was that pressurized environment of, of, of being in this kind of like, you know, mind expansion kind of. I mean, I was saw the acid culture was split between two kind of camps really one was the um you know the uh the kind of ken kesey merry pranksters thing and then there was there was the uh the timothy leary kind of let's sit down in a in a room full of cushions and listen to you know indian meditation music and uh, sometimes them two worlds did sort of collide with each other but i i wouldn't say the first experience was was an enlightening experience. I found it really, really, really bad and terrible. I mean, they were called Pink Floyd, the walls, these, um, and I actually heard someone when I was working at the, the charity before I left saying, Oh yeah, yeah. These, these Pink Floyd, the walls. I was like, oh, Jesus, they still circulating around. But the reason why they were called that, I don't know if you've ever seen the wall by Pink Floyd with Bob mm-hmm. Geldof in it, the thing with the melting faces, it's all that kind of stuff. And, yeah, I mean, you know, it was like that. That was my first time, mm. and it was certainly. Uh, I was just so glad to kind of get my head straight. Do you know what I mean? Because I just thought it, it was like kind of like you know spiraling down into some kind of like really horrible abyss. You know, and um, it's terrifying. So, yeah, yeah, it, it was. I and had it was to that, um... that sense of not being in control. You know, it was uh, yeah. I put this in my memoir. I'm not sure if it's still in the edited uh, edited version. I might it might have got taken out because it was, but um, I had to leave a club once because I I just over, overdone everything, right? Yeah, and so I, I just had to get out and I got out of the club and started walking toward a girlfriend's place because I knew that she 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 got it all, you know, and I, I could just go and 
sort of chill and I had to walk walk across this park and there were people sitting on the swings <laughs> in the pitch black and I was you know the proverbial absolutely off my fucking head right and I walked up this road and there was a street light and there was a shadow coming out the bottom of the street light and my first thought was is somebody lying down on the pavement there and then I walked a few steps closer I thought oh no it's it's the shadow off the street no it wasn't it was it was a, ho a homeless man right yeah and he's lying across the pavement and I think he'd you know, wet himself and all this stuff. And like I say, completely off my head, I leant down and I went, are you all right, mate? And he turned around and went, and he grabbed me. I looked into his face. I swear to God, mate, I was looking at myself. Wow. Yeah. And I was looking at myself with all the stubble, you know, and in in his stunk of alcohol. And I tell you what, I've always used that as a as a a reminder, you know, not to mm. not not to always to get a, you know to remember to get a grip. <laughs> yeah, it... yeah, exactly. I mean, I, I stopped um, all that kind of um, really in two thousand because I'd, I'd I'd removed myself from Brighton. Mm. Brighton, I knew too many people. It was I was easily distracted. You know, I knew the, the junkies, I knew the heads, I knew the potheads, I knew all these sort of... And when I moved to London, because um, I'd been evicted from to this squat in, in Brighton, finally, and um, I didn't know anyone. And that was good, because I could kind of start, you know, a new life, if you like, away from people who I'd get distracted, easily distracted by, do you know what I mean? And... Um, you know, and that's, you know, when I lived in, um, you know, lived in a veterans hostel and then I met my, my future wife and, you know, but no, that it ended. 1999, when I lived in Portugal was probably, you know, and then coming back from that, that, that was quite an intense year of, 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 of doing, you know, stuff. Mm. Um, but yeah, I, I, it was best to not have them people around. So when I was at the, veteran charity and they're, they're working with this project i didn't really want these people to come into my life because i don't want to be distracted by that i don't want to be you know all of a sudden led down that kind of do you know what i mean and it's um when you work with uh people that are facing challenges i think it should be a sort of i don't know if limited hangout in your life is the correct expression uh, it it's very difficult I mean, I did um, drug work, substance misuse, lots of real horrible stuff with the children going on and the social services. And, yeah. and, and because the clients are so damaged, they'll look for any, they would look for any excuse to throw it onto you and basically throw you under the bus. Um, oh, my drug worker said this and he shouldn't. And then, of course, your management would haul you in, and 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 that they would think that they had to do like yeah. the, the disciplinary thing because you know how dare you garden alert yeah. yeah how dare you tell a client that they really need to sort their life out or they're going to lose their children even though that that was the situation right and yeah. and um you you talk about the. You know, the veterans thing, a lot of veterans are trapped into their identities of 20 years ago. And it's it's kind of a, a it, it, it's although someone's got to do this work, I think it's 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 all right for a time in your life. But then it, it, it just to be around that toxicity all the time, it, it's, it's someone said to me, you know, the best way you can help someone who's struggling is not to struggle you know live your life and, and and lead by example and put keep your vibration high um so you, you got any thoughts on that yeah I, I think that's very much what i'm doing 
um, and that that realization. I mean, I mean, one of the good things that I'm taking from it is the fact that I've gone back to music, you know, after a, such a long time, and and this sort of realization of of, of you know, uh, just I mean, it was a bit like the, the interview I had in Colchester. I mean, I, I got up about quarter past three to beat the Dartford tunnel traffic, you know, and all that. And I arrived in Colchester. So like half six in the morning, you know, Mackie D breakfast, all that. And my interview was about 10 AM. So, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm at this thing. And then this guy sort of, you know, I have to be ushered around, you know, and he's got Blakey's on his shoes and I'm thinking, Jesus, man, he must be XRAF regiment. Do you know what I mean? And, and, and all this sort of stuff, which I shouldn't, I don't want to kind of go down that whole kind of narrative of, 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 of you know, not, not what I'm, um, you know, but as I was then and, and uh, I'm thinking, what am I doing here? What am I doing this? You know, I'm, I'm, I've had, I've had this life and now, and it was like when they said that I had to move there, I just thought, Jesus, it's like being back in. I just thought, this is the stuff of nightmares. Do you know what I mean? And, but it was that realization I had to kind of get there to realize that you know i mean i was even doing a series of photographs of um of like military themed geographies you know and i'd i'd photograph the, uh, the the army forts out on the thames estuary i'd photograph the sound mirrors um you know uh, in dungeon uh, and i even got onto salisbury plain um because i met up a guy on instagram who actually was a fan of my work and had my two books and he he got me in and I was photographing the impact areas where all the mangled tanks were. And I thought, yeah, this is great. And then it was a period where I joined the Royal Photographic Society and I thought, yeah, you know. But as I took come away from, from the charity and that resignation letter and, 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 and getting into the, to, to music and practicing uh, every day on a saxophone, I just thought, I just don't need this stuff anymore. Do you know what I mean? It's, you know, what am I, what am I trying to trying to achieve and like i said earlier you know it's it's you know I, i'll always in especially in the evening in the art world i'll always be reminded of the fact that i was you know uh, you know an ex-para who did these pictures in northern ireland at a certain time da 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 da, da. i mean the ex-para thing was it was like an elephant in the room it's like you know i could could go and you know become an astronaut but it would be ex-para goes to space do you know what i mean and and I want want it to sort of really move away from that because I'm not an ex para. I'm Stuart Griffiths. Do you know what I mean? I'm uh, I'm you know worked in photography. I've I've, I've got a, a, a history of it. Um, you know, it's but there's also there's more to it, and and that's what the saxophone has been for me because really. Um, that was a kind of crossroads moment and and I'm kind of I'm kind of revisiting that 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 thing and it makes me happy as well and I always had this idea that I'd, one day I'd have an an alto saxophone and I'd be playing it in some kind of you know apartment in apartment kind of place in New York City or something you know that kind of vision of uh, of of you know just let, letting the, the, the soul and blues come out, you know, through that. And, and that's what I'm exercising that, that, that person, that, 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 you know, that vision of, or, oh, you know, that, that kind of dream of, 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 and. What was and, it? Um, yeah. Uh, sorry. I did, I did want to ask you, Stuart, what, what was it like? Cause you photographed a lot of people that, that got injured in Afghanistan. Did you not? And, and didn't you, report on some of the funerals yeah i did all that yeah i i uh, i did a lot of uh, i mean i photographed um the two guys who were in the um in the kajaki um but the film was based upon mm. um i had that um many others um the funerals as well because i was doing a body of work on on, on military funerals and I, it, I the, the tipping point for me in the funerals was I ended up going all the way to Scunthorpe um, to Brian Budd's funeral. Now he got Victoria Cross, and I had my cameras with me, and I just thought I couldn't I couldn't physically 
do anything with the cameras. I couldn't take your pictures. I knew quite a few of the lads there and stuff, you know, from my time. And I thought, what am I doing? And I'd gone all that way from when I was living in London at the time, um, Camberwell, gone all that way. And I thought, you know, what? I mean, I'd, I'd gone as far as Sunderland. I'd even, you know, Scotland, you know, doing all these. And it just kind of just started getting to me. Do you know what I mean? And, uh, and when that pullout happened, I just it it just it just summed up just how the the political system in, in this country is is for me personally is not fit for purpose. Uh, it's divided so many people. It's it's uh, made a mockery out of of, of of many things, and I just had enough. And and I just felt I can't do your flag waving stuff anymore that is it you know and uh and even at the and i was i was working at the charity at that time and the way the boss was kind of going on about oh well you know we, we did a good job just just get on with it i'm thinking no it's not that you know I, I went and saw the tears of people the grief you know from yeah from scumthorpe to, to sussex to to lee to to glasgow you know all these places and you know it it, it starts to take its toll. And, and again, with the, the, the portraits that I was doing, um, you know, this was stuff before, you know, people really, you know, weren't, weren't, weren't focusing on that at all. It was, it was much, a lot of the, I mean, I even did the Wharton Bassett thing as well. I was, I was regularly sent to Wharton Bassett, you know, the more bodies that were coming back, the more press that was sent there, you know, it was like some kind of dark tourism kind of thing. And, uh, yeah, it, it it's it's this, this the whole voice I was I was creating through that. You know, the fact that I was a homeless veteran, I become like some, you know, oh this guy was be, was a homeless ex serviceman. You know, and all this sort of stuff, and and you think, what was all that about? You know, I mean, this is all part of my you know history and and stuff. I'll send you the link to the isolation um, film because. Much of that is 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 talked about, um, and and that was that was premiered at the Edinburgh Film Festival in was it two thousand and nine, and it toured the uh, the UK with um, a, a live um, live music score because the, one of the directors is a musician. It's all the picture house cinemas, you know, the Curzon ones, what used to sell show the arty films, and um, yeah, it, it's. And and like like I said earlier, you know, you, you do these things, and then you've always got some some muppet who thinks they know something more, you know, and 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 the, you know they've they've got a higher rank or or, or or something or you know, and I just couldn't, I just couldn't, you know, I mean, it's a bit like when I went and did a doctorate. When I had the interview to to do a doctorate, he said, um, you know, why do you want to do a PhD? And, and what I said was, I, it will give me some authority as an artist, a photographer, whatever you want to call it, uh, so I could deal with 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 this this hierarchy that I get within military discourse, which military debate. And but not even that really means anything. I mean, when I went to the Veterans Mental Health Conference in Kings, I mean, they're all patting each other on the back, going, "Yeah, brilliant, brilliant," and and. I actually, when I went there last year, was it last year? Yeah, last year. Because I'm not going to go again. I actually drunk myself to oblivion with someone from some armed forces network or whatever. And they had all these bottles of red wine. And I'm, I think I lost count after the sixth bottle of, of red wine that I necked, do you know? And, it, and when I walked back to London Bridge, I was pulled by the police because obviously my eyes were spinning in my head and stuff. And um, they had to ring my wife, and, and I'm, I'm a father as well, and and um, it was just, and, and it just got to a, that point where I've got to change my life. This is not doing me any good. I mean, I even met the, um, it was the uh, the veterans minister, that that guy's MP of Aldershot. You know, oh, was you a para? Yes, yes, yeah, brilliant. yeah, I know such and such. Yeah, 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 yeah. You know the the tra the traff. You know. And I just thought, I don't like these people. I don't like these politicians. I don't like this 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 whole, you know, flag shagging thing. Do you know what I mean? And 
And it's like, you know, I'm not. I, I had to find the inner jazz man in me and uh, and and re- and remember who I was, you know, because it was just taking it was taking over my life, and and it was making my wife unhappy, my kids unhappy, and uh, and 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 that's why I, when I walked away, it was it was a, it was a, a, yeah, it, it was kind of like just shedding myself of this this shit. I just no longer needed. Do you know what I mean? I didn't want to, you know, you know, be a victim in the victim mode. You know, working for a victim sort of organisation because at the end of the day, they're there to kind of number crunch and keep the victims in there. You know, I mean, there was all this, you know, all sorts of walks of life coming out of prison. This that sex offenders register. I, I just didn't. I just didn't need these people in my life. Do you know what I mean? Mm-hmm. Can you imagine like? how many young men and women like lost lost limbs or eyes or parts of their body i mean not in addition to those who didn't come back yeah in afghanistan and now they all i mean there must be thousands upon thousands and they all have to live with the fact that they just pulled out yeah you know not just pulled out but left all the weapons there which was the reason they they quote unquote allegedly went in in the first place yeah no it was it, it was it was a, yeah i mean can i just sorry yeah. clarify because people will be messaging me no what i mean is folks off the back of the events in new york and washington 20 years ago they said there were training camps in afghanistan and that's why we had to go oh in there and and well, clearly that's not the case. If when they pulled out, they left all their ar- armaments, <laughs> all top class, you know, night vision goggles and tanks and helicopters and, and rifles and and left basically the best equipped. Now the 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 the, the, the T people over there, as they call them, because we we get flagged if we say that word. Uh, now they're the best equipped army in the world. So you know. I don't know what geopolitical kind of you know. Um you know, stuff which is probably going to be shelved in the National Archives for the next 30 years under some secrecy, whatever bullshit. But I lost all faith in all that when that all happened. I talked to a friend of mine. Um, he just got back. He managed to get out when he was working in private security. You know, I I, I, I got him um, introduced to people who worked in that, that years ago when when... I was in communi- communicados with, with them them types, and just hearing what he said, just the, the whole shambles of it, I just thought, you know, I mean, it was just that was it. It was it. It, mm. it was it was shameful, shameful. Mm. Stuart, before we before we say our goodbyes, is there anything you want to promote? I I'd put a link for your book below, but. It only seems to be in hardcover, and it seems to have um... sold out. Yeah, you can get it on Amazon for like sort of ridiculous amounts of money. But uh, I mean, I, I'm actually hoping when 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 the um, if the, uh, the, the the TV production happens, you know, there they might be a, a reissue with you know a kind of forward on it and stuff like that. But until that kind of happens, really. But I'll keep you in the loop. But um, I'll certainly send you the link to the um, to the isolation um, film that was made back in 2008, um, mm. which really kind of, yeah, a lot of things started happening after that. And a lot of these, like, say, the, the charities all started emerging because, you know, again, it's like... <laughs> You put people in harm's way, and uh, and uh, and this is this is what happens on the return. And um, you know, I've spent a lot of time on that, and um, and I think with with resigning from that job was it was something in me was saying you need to take a break, you know, you need to you need to take you need to rest, and and doing a PhD as well, which you know was was great it's great to have a doctor although when i worked at the charity they said don't put doctor before your name because it only confuses the lads you know because that's um, um and i i have found it um tricky to think well where do i go with that 
but at least I've got it anyway. Um, it's it's part of you know my toolkit. Um, you know, it's uh, and I think it's just a matter of 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 survival. I've got the love of my family, and um, and I'm and I'm practicing this this alto saxophone. It was so mm-hmm. when I, when that came through the post it was just a beautiful thing. I was just like wow because you know having a brand new you know saxophone. I mean, the the one I had in '83 was a battered old boozy and hawks sort of silver thing full of punctures. I mean, I couldn't even play in the band because it was so punctured. You know what I mean? But this is just like you know, it was it's great. And, and even my teacher said, "Well, you got an okay tune, you know." It's because what I want to do is. It's all it's all very well on this jazz freak out, but it's about playing a really beautiful tone. You know what I mean? Mm. And and that's what he's teaching me. And uh, I'm really really chuffed. And and they all get this organisation in Belfast, which I've, I've it was through the Warrington Peace Centre, which I was involved in since 2005, which was set up after the Warrington bombing. And um, the fact that when I told him about this story. The, the woman in Belfast. He says, "This is this will really help change, change your, change your, you know, change your whole way of thinking." And she and, and I just felt brilliant. It's been recognised that the power of music and learning music is so important for mental health because you're learning something, you know, and it's it's like a perfect distraction. It's like when I start to have when the nightmares start to filter in, I just. All of a sudden, I just kind of start thinking about all the different scales and the notes and stuff like that, and it just it totally distracts me. And it's you know, it, sometimes the, the nightmares can filter through, and it becomes a little bit of a battle. But because I've got that, you know, and I, and, I, and I'm and I'm working on it every day, it's 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 really helping. So the power of music or learning an instrument is. You know, you're never, you're never too young, to put it that way. <laughs> Amen, brother. Stu's great, great chatting to you. Um, just stay on the line so I can thank you properly. But yeah. for the purposes of the recording, um, yeah, what, what a great chat. I hope, friends at home, I hope you got as much out of this as I did. Um, if you are struggling, reach out. Um, if you're battling trauma, really helps just leave things in the past. Because that the past doesn't exist anymore. We've only got the present. Um, life's too short to leave your identity ten years ago, twenty years ago, um, and reach out if you're struggling. If you can like and subscribe, friends, I'd really appreciate that. And uh, we'll see you next time. <laughs>